I can say without exaggeration that Exodus was a quantum leap forward for the Ultima franchise. It's still largely a one-man project, but more people are involved in the marketing, manual creation, and art, and Ken Arnold was hired to create the musical score. Richard Garriott went with Sierra Online for Ultima 2, largely because they were willing to produce the cloth map that he wanted to include. Unfortunately, Sierra had decided to enter the console market just as the Atari crash hit, almost wiping out the company, again making it very difficult for Richard to claim the royalties he was owed. While Sierra eventually recovered, Garriott was done with trusting his fortunes to third parties and founded his own publisher, Origin Systems, to publish Ultima 3. I'm Michael Corlum, and this is an analytical playthrough of Ultima 3 Exodus. If you haven't watched my analysis of the first two games, I'll go ahead and link to those in the video notes. I'll be playing the PC port available through GOG.com, which is probably the best way to play the game if you're interested in giving it a try on a modern computer. It was originally released on the Apple II and was ported to other 8-bit computers like the Atari 800, Commodore 64, and PC. In 1986, it was released for the 16-bit Amiga, Atari ST, Macintosh, and the Japanese PC-88, MSX, and FM7 computers. It saw a Nintendo Entertainment System port in 1987, and it's surprisingly decent with unique graphics and expanded dialogue. I'll go ahead and point out the major differences when we encounter them, because there are quite a few. They do make the game a bit more straightforward in parts, and it, visually, it, it strongly remembers JRPGs like Dragon Quest, which had been released the year before. A nice bit of recursive design, as Dragon Quest itself had been strongly influenced by the Ultima games. I'm also using the Ultima 3 upgrade patch from the Exodus project, which gives us a VGA tile set and music from the Commodore and Apple II versions. The PC release initially lacked any kind of music at all. The patch also, I believe, fixes a bug where monsters in the PC release spawned at a much lower rate, which, after playing Ultima 2, I really don't want to deal with. In its initial release, the game came with three books. The Book of Play, which is the instructions on a bestiary, the Ancient Litany of Truth, containing details on the cleric spells, and the Book of Ember Runes, detailing the wizard spells. These last two are written in character. The book also includes a reference card, a cloth map, and an ad for the book Secrets of Cesaria, a book of maps with game hints players could buy. The Japanese FM7 and NEC Computer Editions also came with a jigsaw puzzle, and the Nintendo port came with a single, smaller instruction manual instead. The book of play also gives us our backstory for the game. Twenty years have passed since the defeat of Minax, and we're back in Cesaria again, with no mention given to Earth whatsoever. Fragments of a manuscript recovered from Minax's castle hint at some offspring from Mundane and his apprentice, and recently there have been various dark signs and portents, like a fiery island rising from the sea. Then the monsters show up again, and the great earth serpent rises from its slumber. A derelict merchant vessel was discovered with the word Exodus written in blood on its deck, and Lord British put out a call for heroes to save the day. This is never referred to directly in the text of the game itself, but the NPCs will reference Exodus in some of the flavor text, which is an improvement over the first two games where you'd never hear the main plot referenced even in passing. On to character creation. It's a big departure from the first two games. Instead of a single character, you get a party of four, chosen from 11 different classes and four races. The Nintendo port even gives you pre-made characters to choose from, one of each class, if you don't feel like making your own. The game pairs down to only four attributes from the earlier games as six. Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, and Wisdom. Strength governs damage done, Dexterity your chance to hit and the chance you'll dodge traps, Intelligence gives you magic points for wizard spells, and Wisdom gives you magic points for cleric spells. Your choice of race gives you a maximum in each attribute. Humans get a max 75 across the board. Dwarves get a 99 max strength and only a 50 max intelligence. Elves have a higher max dexterity, low max wisdom. Fuzzies get a very low max strength of 25 and 99 max dexterities and intelligence. Bobbits have a max of 50 dexterity but a max 99 wisdom. So what elves and dwarves are is pretty obvious. Bobbits are just hobbits renamed in an OC do not steal kind of way to protect origin from the Tolkien estate, but what is a fuzzy? New for Ultima 3, fuzzies are weak but highly intelligent and dexterous, may probably taken from H. Beam Piper's fuzzy novels. This may be why they aren't featured again after this game, disappearing as quickly as they arise. In fact, all of the non-humans disappear after Ultima 3, aside from some dwarves in Ultima Underworld and elves in Ultima Online. The fuzzies are possibly reimagined as emps in Ultima 7, 
but for now, let's stick to the world of Ultima 3. And in the world of Ultima 3, we do not actually meet any NPCs that are written as non-human, nor are any of the other races' existence referenced in any way. The manual doesn't go into any depth, they don't show up as monsters in the bestiary, so character creation is literally the only place they exist in the world the game presents to us. We can pick our race because fantasy RPGs have a race. We also have 11 classes to choose from, primarily distinct by what magic they can use, whether they can steal or disarm traps, and what armor and weapons they're available to use. We can consider the clerics, wizards, thieves, and fighters the four base classes, distinguished by their use of prayer magic, sorcery, stealing, or weapon and armor availability, respectively. Druids have weak armor, but can use both prayers and sorcery, and in all but the Nintendo port, regenerate magic points twice as fast. Rangers can also use both kinds of magic, but instead of faster MP recovery, they have better access to weapons. Alchemists are basically wizards that can steal. Illusionists are clerics that can steal. Larks are wizards who can use bows. Paladins are clerics with better combat abilities. And barbarians are basically fighters, but with worse armor and the ability to steal and disarm traps. There are a lot of different possible party configurations we can go with. None of them have any impact on the story, and as long as we have a wizard or a cleric, we should be fine. For this playthrough, we'll go with the classic fighter, mage, cleric, thief. First up, we've got our thief. Let's go with an elf, giving us a better steal and disarm rate. We're going to name him Sneaks. Our cleric is going to be a dwarf, who we'll name Healy. For our wizard, let's go with a fuzzy named Piper, and our fighter will go with Stranger, the protagonist we played in my Ultima 2 video. We're going to focus on Intelligence for Piper, Wisdom for Healy, and Dexterity for Sneaks and Stranger. Dexterity is a big deal for our combatants, both on defense and offense, which makes it more important than strength. Party Maid were once more dropped into the land of Cesaria with a minimal armor and weapons, just an unequipped dagger and cloth armor. We've got a different screen layout than the first two games. A custom character set means that our text is no longer restricted to a small window at the bottom of the screen. About half of the screen is the game world, and the right half shows our character stats and the command window. At the bottom of the world screen is an indicator as to which direction the wind is blowing, and top center we have a display of Cesaria's two moons and what phase they're currently in. In the Nintendo port, and with the patch I'm using, the phases are depicted graphically, but in other ports they're shown as numbers from 0 to 7. For each character, we get their name and an initial for their condition. G means good. We might otherwise be poisoned, dead, or turned to ash, which is basically dead but more expensive to revive. The second line is a letter for gender, race, and type. Sneaks is a male elven thief. M is magic points, and only our cleric and wizards have them, and they're limited to their wisdom and intelligence stats of 25 each. We also see our level, health, and food on the last line. Level actually has a function in Ultima 3. For the first time, our characters have a maximum hit points, starting at 150, instead of being able to basically heal as high as we want to. Each time we go up a level, we can visit Lord British, who will bump up our max hit points by 100. This means we can take more hits, but level does not directly make us more capable of hitting or damaging our foes, and doesn't give our casters more magic points or spells. That will have to wait quite some time. This is a lot of screen real estate taken up by UI elements compared to modern games, and more in the first two Ultima games, but it's not terrible. The only change I'd make is maybe getting rid of the race class gender reminder for each character, as it literally never matters, and maybe adding in how much gold each player is currently carrying. We start out right next to Britain in Lord British's castle, so we can head right on in. Town designs are vastly improved over Ultima 2, they individually have a strong sense of character, and more of our NPCs have something to say beyond the generic stock phrases. We do still get a lot of those stock phrases, but the Nintendo version drops this, giving each NPC unique flavor text. We can check the stats of all of our characters, again, one at a time, with the Z key for stats, and we see that each of our characters tracks their money, food, and inventory separately. This, again, chiefly serves to complicate things, as you'll need to manually pool the party's gold before shopping, and manually share food and tools as required. As we pass through the pub, we get our first clue. 
The guy in the corner here tells us that Exodus lies beyond the Silver Snake. We also meet future companion Dupre, who was technically introduced in Ultima 2, though on a planet there was no reason to ever visit. While improved over Ultima 2's townfolk clues, Ultima 3's aren't quite as easy to follow as later games would have them. We're still going to have to construct their meaning from aggregate, but Richard Gary does a lot better in presenting a coherent world this time. Just don't expect any handholding. The Nintendo version's NBC dialogue has been changed up to make these clues less poetic and more straightforward. The shopkeeper provides us with a list of weapons to choose from, and again in our menus we will have to refer to them by letter. Commands don't usually remind us of what each letter means, so we'll have to refer to our inventory with the Z stats command frequently until we remember what letter a, say, bow is. Likewise, the Z stats button is again going to be our pause button. A few seconds of inaction passes a turn which is dangerous in combat and wastes food out of combat, though we do slowly heal both hits and magic as we wait. This is the first Ultima game in which we have a natural regeneration. We're going to want to buy a bow for our thief, or blowgun in the Nintendo port, a mace for our cleric, and a sling for our fighter, and we'll have to pool our gold with the Jake join key to do that. We can either pool each time someone wants to buy something, or hand off weapons as the purse carrier buys them. As far as armor goes, let's buy leather for the thief, and that's all we can really afford at the moment, so it'll have to do. This fellow gives us the tip to head around back. As you can see, Ultima 3 uses a line of sight mechanic, hiding from us what's behind buildings or in thick woods. The game uses this to give us spaces to explore, and it's a reward when we find something or someone hidden away. The tips aren't always super vital, only with exotic arms can you win, but it feels good to find it. Putting these two in the first town like this is great intentional game design on Garriott's part, an incident of teaching the player that these hidden places exist and encouraging us to seek out more as we play. We're also not going to find any science fiction elements in any of our towns or dungeons, and there's no space minigame. Cesaria feels more like an intentionally designed world than a random collection of what the developer thought would be cool. It's still cohesive, if a little generic heroic fantasy. Uh, the world will gain more unique character as the series goes on, but right now we're seeing the foundations. In a lot of ways, Ultima 3 is the culmination of what Richard Garriott learned making Ultima 1 and 2. It is a complete experience. It's not perfect by any means, and still feels really archaic by modern standards, but it does feel like a complete experience despite the yet awkward user interface. It might not feel like a modern game to us in 2023, but it does feel like a professional product. Next up, we're going to visit the castle. Here we meet another one of our named NPCs, Chuckles the Jester, who first appeared in Ultima 2's Pirate Harbor. Chuckles is the in-game representation of Richard Garriott's high school buddy Chuck Buche, who would go on to port many of the early Ultima games away from the Apple II. A lot of the NPCs in these games are based on Richard's real-world friends. Dupre, who we met in the tavern, was based on Garriott's friend Greg Dykes. In Lord British's throne room, we meet Iolo and Guino, more friends of Garriott's, husband and wife David Watson and Kathleen Jones, who we met through the Society for Creative Anachronism. Lord British is, of course, himself Richard Garriott's alter ego, and here serves only the purpose of giving us more hit points when we go up in levels. We haven't gained any experience yet, so there's not really any much more reason for us to be here, aside from more NPC flavor text, and locked doors and forest fields we can't get past. Aside from Lord British, these real-world analogs are generally absent from the Nintendo port, replaced by more generic NPCs. Amusingly, the one replacing Guino asks you if you are a descendant of Link. Yes, that Link. Two more features present in the Nintendo port only are a blood bank, where players can trade 100 hit points for 30 gold, and an inn, which is the only place in the game you can save. In the other ports, you can save in Cesaria's world map with the Q key, and it'll autosave if you exit or enter a town, castle, or dungeon, or if a character dies. Making backups of your save file is lightly cheating, but not a bad idea in such an unforgiving game with such an awkward interface. We check out the outskirts of the castle in case there's something there, there isn't, and leave. 
Exodus contains far less grinding than the first two Ultimas, but it is time to get started. We need to earn the gold to buy our fighter a bow and both the cleric and fighter better armor. We also want to raise our level enough so that pirate ships start spawning because we're going to need one of those too. Ultima 3's combat system is a huge leap forward. Encountering an enemy takes us to a turn-based tactical battle screen where we can issue commands to our characters one by one. A wizard ends this fight as soon as his turn comes up with the Rapond spell, Repel on the Nintendo version, a spell that has a 50% chance to instantly kill orcs, goblins, and trolls. Between it and the Cleric's Pontori spell, doing the same for skeletons, zombies, and ghouls, a lot of these early fights are going to go fast. These spells are detailed in the Book of Amber Runes for wizard spells and the Litany of Truth for cleric spells. Each is cast with a different key, so to cast our Rapond or Pontori key spell, we'd hit C for cast, and then A for that spell. As in Ultima 2, some spells can only be cast in dungeons, some in the overworld, and some in combat. Cleric spells tend towards healing, and we won't be able to cast their few but very powerful attacks for some time. Wizards have a lot more attack spells, but right now we only really have the MP for the weakest. The victory gives us a chest on the map, and we can press G to get it with our thief. Chests are often trapped, but an elven thief stands the best chance of avoiding them. We find some more goblins and our wizard eliminates most of them as soon as we stop fumbling the keyboard commands. If you wait too long on a turn, the game skips that character, and we get 3 experience per. This is an issue because only the character who makes the kill gets the experience points, meaning that our wizard is going to get the most right now because undead won't spawn until level 2 or 3, and our cleric likes a ranged weapon, they're going to be lagging behind. I'm going to do the best I can to keep characters advancing at around the same rate because the highest level, again, means more difficult foes, so I want to make sure everybody has enough hit points to withstand what the game throws at us. As you can see, these encounter rates are also improved in Ultima 3, especially compared to 2. These cut purses are unaffected by our cleric and wizard's easy kill spells, so we're going to fall back to a simple 2x2 two two formation that will serve us well the whole game. The thief, with his good dexterity to help him dodge attacks, will fight in the front, alongside the cleric who lacks a ranged attack, but can wear chainmail armor when we are able to afford it. Our rear guard is the wizard, who can throw knives or cast his mitar spell to attack with a projectile, and our fighter, who will be giving a bow to as soon as we save up the coin. The enemy pathfinding is direct and, well, dumb, so they'll line up nicely for the slaughter every time. They're even dumber in the Nintendo port. There you can use a 1x4 configuration and they won't go around the front fighter to attack the others. This one might be a problem. Balrons. We are seriously outleveled. But it turns out that it's not too difficult. Maybe they were weaker than standard, uh, though they gave us the standard 20 experience points. Maybe we just got unlucky, and then lucky again. Anyway, we're going to grind long enough to afford good gear for every character, get to a high enough level that the pirate ship appears, and by that point, we'll have the gold to move on without needing to grind too much for a while. With frequent spawns and tactical combat, it shouldn't be too tedious. Okay, that did take a while, but time went much more quickly than it did in the first games thanks to a more engaging combat system. Our fighter now has a bow, and everyone has the best armor we can get them at the moment. We found our pirate ship spawned after we hit level 3. They don't show up until 5 in the Nintendo port. 
Ships can fire at us as we approach, and we all take a bit of damage, but beating the pirates isn't too difficult if we stand near the gangplanks. We've got a boat! Travel is a little aggravating due to the wind mechanic, which only serves to make us not move if the wind is calm or blowing against the direction we want to go. It doesn't stop us, it's just annoying, and this is the only thing in the game the wind affects. It's a spot of realism I could have done without. These man of war are annoying too. Nothing we can't beat, but they can poison us, which means a trip back to Lord British for a cure until we can cast the spell ourselves. Still, they do give us a lot of experience. Unfortunately, they don't drop any treasure. We can grind a bit more on the boat. If we use the cannons, we get no treasure or XP, but we can use the gangplanks as choke points, aiding to our tactical choices. I figure level 4 or 5 is good for now, because 5 is actually a cap. We can gain more levels, but Lord British won't increase our max hits past 550 until we have the Mark of Kings. In the computer ports, grinding is better on land. The boats don't save us food consumption like they did in earlier Ultimas, and the spawn rates are lower, but in the Nintendo port and with our patch, these problems can be avoided. We've hit level 5, so let's take a break to hit the tavern. As in Ultimas 1 and 2, the tavern in Exodus is a source of rumors as long as we can pay. Drinks are 7 gold, but if we pay extra, we get one rumor for each value from 10 to 90 coins. Again, the bartenders share a common set of rumors. This is different in the Nintendo port. Instead, each town's bartender has two unique rumors, one for 30 gold and one for 50, so to get them all, you need to visit the pub in each town. Ultima 3 is less dependent on its bartenders than the first two games were, but we still get some good tips and clues here. Ambrosia. Never heard of it? Dawn, the city of myths and magic. These first two are really more foreshadowing than anything else. A conjunction of the moons finds Link. This is a bigger hint, uh, not about the elf from the Zelda series, but about the functions of the moon gates, and it's a little more explicit in the Nintendo port. Nasty creatures, nasty dark, sure thee ready for the embark. This is vaguely about dungeons being dangerous, I guess. None returned, or so I'm told, from the pool dark and cold. Mentioning the whirlpool, which we'll get to later. Shrines of knowledge, shrines of strength, all are lost into the brink. Which is directly tied to our last clue, though we may not realize it immediately. Fountains fair and fountains foul are all found in the dungeon's bowel. Dungeons hold fountains which either cure or hurt you. Exodus Ultima 3, which is next? Now it could be. This is just some general hype. The Nintendo port hy hypes Ultima 5. Steak ye out the Lord of Time, and the one way is a sure find. Another big hint that we're going to need to find this Lord of Time at some point. So, some useful clues, and not as much world building as you might have expected. We weren't given enough to tell us directly what to do next exactly. For that, we need to talk to a lot of NPCs and put together an image of what the game contains from their scattered dialogue. Even then, to find the specifics, we're not told exactly what to do next. We need to explore, actually find the towns, find and discover what's in each dungeon. Ultima 3 is still very open world, and despite the smaller landmass, the game is a lot less linear than Ultima 2 was. Before we go off wandering for clues, though, we're going to have to deal with that pesky level cap. We can still gain experience and go up a level, but if you try to get more max hit points than 550, Lord British will direct you after the Mark of Kings, but nobody in the game tells you where or what it is yet. Much later in the game, you, you can learn that they're gained in dungeons, basically marks or hot metal that your characters brand themselves with, but we're going to sequence break just a tiny bit and just go to where it is. I guess knowing what dungeon it's in isn't really sequence breaking, but you know, you know what I mean. I don't normally want to rely on shortcuts in these analytical playthroughs because I'm trying to present the experience of the games, but frankly, breaking the cap means more the earlier you do it, and I want to gain enough max hit points just by questing so there's less grinding later. 
and we're not really going to be skipping any content. I suppose it's not really too important in the long run, but the dungeon we need is right next to Britain, and it's actually pretty easy. Dungeons are dark by default, but our cleric and wizard have spells to create light. Wizard utility spells are cheaper, so we'll start with those. It won't last long, but it won't have to. We're just going to go in and out real fast. Perninian Depths. That's how we know the name of this dungeon. Nobody else ever refers to it, or to most of the other dungeons. There's no lore on them inside the game, and even if some of them have evocative names, they're just cool names that Richard Garriott came up with, rather than describing their contents. The Dungeon of Fire doesn't have any fire in it. There are no ore or mine carts in the mines of Morinia. They do have these spots with misty writing that have little clues or flavor text, but they're by necessity short and sometimes misleading. Dungeons just sort of exist as part of the world, and nobody really seems to need to comment on it or interrogate why. It's a fantasy RPG, and fantasy RPGs have dungeons, so there are dungeons. Dungeons are not optional in Ultima 3 because they contain these marks. There are four of them in the game, and when you find them, it costs each character 50 hit points to brand themselves. Fortunately, everybody can do it at once, so we don't need to make multiple trips. Now that we're done, our cleric can cast Rex Sue to teleport us up a level and out of the dungeon. See? That wasn't so hard. We saw a few locked doors in Castle Britain, so to continue gathering information we're going to need keys, which are sold alongside the other tools in Thieves Guild stores. Again, we are never directed specifically to these stores or told that they exist. Last game, we just had to murder a whole bunch of guards to find these keys. As players, you would discover the guilds through exploration. The most accessible guild store is in Grey, which is not too far away and doesn't even require our ship. We just have to cross the continent, and it's not far. The cards here are a bit rougher in character, telling us to watch it instead of good day. A few touches like this gives Grey a slightly seedier atmosphere than the other towns will visit, but even more than Ultima 2, each location gets its own nature, though in a subtle way and with fewer jokes. Only exotics will protect us from great evil. This is true, but it doesn't really help us yet. The pub is full of pirates, but they don't really get in our way too much. In the back is where we find the guild, which stocks tools. Keys are self-explanatory, and we'll need maybe a dozen to get through the game. Torches are also good, they last a lot longer than our spells did. Powder functions like the strange coins in Ultima 3, freezing in enemies for a short time if used by a thief. And gems let us get a quick view of the area around us. Helpful in dungeons, but we'll get a spell to do that for us by the time we might need it. Exotic clues found at dawn. Exotics here are a noun, not an adjective, and we've had one other clue to dawn from the barkeep. It's some kind of mythic city. This here is a bit of a trap. We go in, we get jumped. The treasure is real, but we'd have to fight our way out past the guards. Not something we can handle at this point in the game, so let's just leave for now. The Nintendo version of Grey has a little less character, but it does hold a casino where we can wager on our gold on a rock-paper-scissors minigame. Now it's back to Castle of Britain with our shiny new keys.
I don't know why this guy's following us like that. He's not attacking, just inconvenient. It's not as difficult to move around him as you might think, as long as you don't need to step directly on his tile. We find another little hidden area out back, and a boat that can take us out on the moat. The wise cleric tells us four cards, four slots. Well, you don't know what that means, but it's a big clue, so write it down. In fact, you should be writing everything down, it's that kind of game, and most of the clues will only make sense when taken as a whole with other clues on the same topic. Here we go, the Oracle. He works the same as in the last game, like an upscale version of the Bartender. Give him increments of 100 gold and he'll give us useful tips. Thankfully, this time we do have the gold to hear what he has to say. You'll learn of marks and playing cards in Hidden Holy Shrines. Of marks, I say there are but four of Fire, Force, Snake, and King. Learn their use in Devil Guard, or death you'll surely bring. Devil Guard is a town we'll run into, and that's where we learn more about them. This is a rare clue that tells us where to go, though it'll take some doing to actually find the place. Shrines there are again but four to which you go and pray. Their uses are innumerable, and their clues throughout, I say. Again, the Nintendo clues are less poetic and more direct. They tell us outright that the shrines are where we find the cards, and where we can get blessings. The cards their suits do number four, called Soul, Moon, Death, and Love. Unto the monsters thou must go for guidance from above. That's where we'll find out more about the cards in two towns called Monter East and Monter West, another clear path. To aid thee in thy cryptic search to dungeons thou must fare, to seek out the Lord of Time to help you if he cares. Which dungeons? We, we don't get that much information. Like I said earlier, dungeons are mandatory, but not all dungeons. And for the most part, the only way we learn that is by exploring and mapping them. The Oracle offers different tips in the Nintendo port, and fewer of them. Only five, but they are more direct and explicit, as I've said. Next, we're going to head to the Town of Moon for yet more clues. It's far to the west of Britain, roughly north of Grey. In the Nintendo port, Moon is most notable for holding the temple. The only place in the game where a character who is raised dead failed can be reconstituted from their ashes. In the computer ports, this can be accomplished at any healer. Seek ye the Shrines of Truth. Bribe the guards and they will leave. See how the word bribe was in brackets? It's one of Ultima 3's more clever features. The O other key command lets you type in verbs, and this is how we learn them, by talking to NPCs. Of course, the game doesn't make this explicit, players would have to figure it out through trial and error, but if we press O then type in bribe, we can get rid of a few guards without starting a fight. There are a couple mission critical verbs that we learn this way. It doesn't work that way in the Nintendo version, there are simply NPCs who lock new menu options in the interface. 
Another change is that we don't learn about the Bride Command and Moon in the Nintendo port. Instead, we're directed to the town of Devilguard, which is where we would learn about it. This guy tells us he's been beyond the whirlpool, contrary to the rumor we got from the bartender. This is a pretty big clue for later, but again, not one that's direct on its own. Next, we're off to the twin cities of East and West Monter, as directed by the Oracle, due south of Britain. I'm going to skip a bit over the travel and stopping by to increase our max HP as we gain levels and resupplying, but don't worry about it. This video is long enough without me skipping over the repetitive parts. We'll hit East Monter first, the lesser of the two Monters in that it lacks a few of the shops you'd find in West Monter, but what it lacks in shops it makes up for in guards. Cards are useful. We know this. Exotics are useful. We also know this. There's not a lot going on here, so let's go ahead and hit Monter West. Monter West's major feature is a great prison, giving us the chance to use our bribe skill. None shall pass. Very Monty Python. We hit O for other and type in bribe, and he just vanishes. Inside, we can use our keys here to check out the cells. The first prisoner here tells us to search the shrine. Another verb unlocked. Search for cards, the other guy says. We already know the shrines and cards are linked, so these are really the same clue. In fact, in the Nintendo version, there's only one guy, and he gives us both clues, unlocking the search command. Nothing else here, but these guys are going to follow us. Let's walk around town with escaped prisoners. Seek the Jester and Castle Fire. Fire here doesn't refer to a castle's name, and this will make sense soon. Shimino says good food. Another named NPC, this one an alter ego of Richard Gray, like Lord British. Shimino was his Society of Creative Anachronism name. In the Nintendo port, this is instead just straight-up Richard Garriott, who introduces himself as the maker of Ultima. By 1987, when the Nintendo port was released, he'd already cemented his reputation as a designer. Now we head back to Castle British. I really don't care for these Man of War. They can poison us, which is expensive to deal with but you only lose one HP per step, so it's not that, that bad if you have the gold to cure it. Unfortunately, they don't give us any gold. Wrong way, we're looking for the healer. Okay, back through the jail. 
and it's just a bit south, we discover that Lord British has two jesters in some kind of hidden torture chamber. One in water, the other in fire, referenced to by the clue we got in Monter West. This is one of the only real weird moral lapses in the game. We can steal from shops, sure, but we're not required to go on a mass murder spree, but good old Lord British has a hidden torture dungeon. It won't be until the next game that the series really starts to understand that it's taking a moral stance with this kind of thing, and it does so in a big way. Next we're going to take our ship to Fawn, located on islands just north of Britain. It's actually shaped like an island, which is a nice touch and fresh design. This is the big reason we need to come here, the Prey Command. We're told to pray in the Circle of Light, whatever that is, but this isn't the first time we've been told to pray. One of the oracles hinted to pray at the shrines, though it didn't indicate that the pray was an actual command. Pray for the invocation again tells us the command and hints at what it gets us. Once again, in the Nintendo version, we are not given the pray command here, but in you, which we're headed to next. Pass, you need a mark. That's true for a lot of things. Each of the marks we get in the dungeons gets us past a different kind of roadblock. Next we need to hit U just to the east, which is hidden in the middle of a deep forest and can be hard to find without exploring it. The interior of U is also deep forest, which we stumble around in until we find shops or NPCs or whatever. We don't want to search too quickly though, or we'd have stumbled into this lava. This is the circle of light we were talking about in Fawn, and it is here that we can use the Prey command. Yell evocare, which is Latin for evoke. Yell is one of the standard commands in the game, oddly enough, and like other, when we use it, we're asked to type in what we want to yell. This tells us to yell evocare. Why? Well, we're told at one point that we need to invoke the snake, but invoke isn't a command. But we're told in Fawn to pray for invocation and to pray at the Circle of Light. So putting one and one and one together, we get clues to yell evocare at the snake when we encounter it. And that's the kind of clue chain these early games expect you to figure out. This whole sequence is different in the Nintendo port. The temple has a sea of fire that will do a lot of damage to you if you don't have the mark of fire yet, but once you get past it, the priest will teach you the pray command and give you a silver horn, an item that replaces the yell command. That's all we really need here, and we have one more town to visit. Well, two towns, but only one at the moment. We need to go to Devil Guard, but it's located in a completely sealed off valley. To get there, we will need to use the Moon Gates. Moon Gates are a little tricky to use. There are eight of them scattered all over the world map, and each activates at a different time depending on the phase of the first moon at the top of the screen. Jump into it when it shows up, and you'll be taken to one of the gate's destinations based on the phase of the second moon. In the early ports, these phases were shown as numbers 0 through 7, but in the Nintendo port and the VGA patch we're playing, the phases are shown graphically. This is ultimately another form of exploration, and you could probably map this out in an Excel sheet based on the combination of moons if you really wanted to. To get to Devil Guard, we need to make a two moon gate hop. First, we're going to head to the moon gate just west of the Montour Towns. 
It shows up when the first moon is gibbous, waxing, that is, more than half but not yet full, stage 3. If we jump in while the second moon is waxing crescent, which is stage 1, the first little sliver after a new moon, it will take us to an island with a dungeon on it. This is not where we want to go. We need to wait until it's stage 2, half moon, and it will take us to this little valley. The valley here is sort of a moon gate hub and has a gate at each end. The north gate opens when the first moon is at half, and the south gate opens when the first moon is full. We're going to take the north gate and jump through when moon tune is at its waning half, stage 6. They basically look like they're mirroring. This takes us to a much larger valley surrounded by mountains. It is here that we can find the town of Devilguard, which the Oracle told us was a place we'd learn to use our marks. This is one of the two places in the game we can buy horses, which help us outrun enemies on the world map. They're a little pricey for us for now, but if we want them later, we'll be able to find them in the hidden town of Dawn. By that point, however, we'll be more concerned with earning XP than avoiding enemies. Seek ye the Dungeon of Fire. This is actually one of the highly optional dungeons, so I don't think we will. The King favors a mark. This is one of the hints that we need the Mark of Kings, and honestly, we're only level 6 right now, so we probably could have just saved getting it until after our visit. A mark helps invoke the snake. This is our clue that we'll need more than just the invocation to get past the snake. Hot metal leaves a mark. If we hadn't encountered it yet, this would be the clue that to get the marks that people are talking about, we basically need to brand ourselves in dungeons. This is one of my favorite fantasy elements in Ultima 3. A magical process based on branding yourself with strange marks discovered in forgotten places. Why does that work? Who built them? Why are there dungeons? Well, because Richard Garriott thought it was neat. And that's also a secret behind the game's title. As far as Richard was concerned, Exodus was just a cool word that has nothing to do with the word's meaning or biblical allusion, and Garriott has stated in interviews that he didn't know its meaning. Marks gained in dungeons, cluing us that the way to gain them is in dungeons. We're not told exactly which dungeons or where the dungeons are. The game really does expect you to simply explore and map every tile, because as you saw when we were in our first dungeon, you cannot see the marks until you're literally standing on top of them. That's all we need here, and we can take the moon gates back to the mainland. Now comes the tricky part. We've heard a few rumors about the whirlpool. First, a bartender telling us that anyone entering it is lost, and secondly, from someone claiming to have gone beyond it. This tells us that there is a beyond it, though nobody elaborates on what. The Whirlpool just sort of zips randomly around the ocean, sucking down anything that comes into contact with it. We've been lucky so far to avoid it because it takes us to another continent, and getting back is a little tricky. We're never told explicitly to go there. Maybe the game expects us to find it on accident, but this other continent, Ambrosia, is where the shrines are hidden, and we've been told to visit them a few times. Let's make this happen. We're running into a bunch of random encounters on the way back to our boat, which is good because we're going to need a bunch of gold for the next part. Eventually we get back to the ship, we left Dock just south of Schwann, and we're going to look for that whirlpool. It's not always easy to find. A note if you're playing the DOS version. Due to system speeds, the Whirlpool is really fast on modern machines unless you're using DOS Box or Mo Slow or something to make it more reasonable. A huge swirling Whirlpool engulfs you and your ship dragging both to a watery grave. Or does it? 
You awaken on the shores of a forgotten land, your ship and crew lost to the sea. I guess we had a crew. Uh, maybe pirates we press-ganged after defeating them? Well, they're, they're dead now, I guess. Ambrosia is a big, empty continent, devoid of towns, and only having a small number of monsters that I think are set and don't spawn randomly. We can't save here, so every Ambrosia run, and we will do many Ambrosia runs, is a single sitting. What the place does have, what we need, are the Shrines of Truth which are the mechanic Ultima 3 gives us to increase our stats. Each stat is tied to a different one of the four shrines. What order you do them in is up to you, but I like to start with Wisdom because only my cleric needs it, and it gives them access to some very useful spells. Finding each shrine, again, takes a lot of exploration and a lot of keys. Most locked doors don't have anything behind them, but there are a few we need to get through to get onto the Wisdom Shrine. And if you don't have a map and haven't played the game before, trial and error is the only way. To get there, we're going to head northeast, follow this forest path around, and eventually we'll hit the peninsula holding the shrine. This is a good time to mention the Nintendo port differences. First, fewer monsters. Second, there's an inn in the northern area where you can save. It automatically saves when you enter the whirlpool and computer ports, and you can't manually save otherwise. Finally, you get a flower here. If given to the Nintendo-exclusive NPC Sherry in Britain, she'll give you a heart compass that you can use to teleport back to Lord British's castle, even from a dungeon or in combat. At the shrine, we have our cleric Healy enter, and we're taken to this screen, which looks like a first-person view of a baptismal font rendered in map tiles. Welcome to the Shrine of Wisdom, offering times 100, asking us how many hundreds of gold we want to sacrifice. For every hundred coins we offer, our wisdom is raised by one. Since our Dwarf Cleric has 25 Wisdom and maxes out at 75, we can offer 5,000 coins to max ourselves out. Offering more does nothing, but it won't stop you from wasting them. This also gives us max MP of 75 and access to all the spells in the Litany of Truth. Besides the ability to cure poison for free and better healing spells, two of our new spells are going to be hugely valuable. Sequitu, which teleports us directly outside from any floor of a dungeon for 40 MP, and Zixkoquib, which instantly defeats almost every foe on the screen. It is the ultimate combat spell. There is a similar wizard spell, but we're doing wisdom first because the other spells are also super useful. We don't need wisdom on any of the other PCs, so we're done here. Oh, before we go, we're going to search and we find a card, Death. We will need four of these cards for the end game and one is hidden at each shrine. To head back to Cesaria, we need to head back through the Whirlpool, and for that we need a new ship. Fortunately, there are some pirates hanging out down here, and to find them, we need to pass through a dark forest maze. We run into some gargoyles, which gives us a chance to try out our new Cleric Mass Murder spell. It's a bit of a waste, but it's cool, even if it sucks up almost all of our MP. This spell will be a great way to help our cleric stay caught up in levels to the other PCs. You can't cast it every combat, but if you wait for a battle full of high experience monsters, you can jump up level really fast. We beat the pirates, steal their ship, spend some time using our more powerful healing spells to rest and strengthen. It wastes a little food, sure, but healing is more expensive to pay for, and return to the whirlpool. We get the same text and are spit back out into the normal world. Fortunately, this time we keep our ship. We're going to need some gold. Lots of gold to max out everybody's stats at the shrines. Well, not all of the stats. Only Healy needs wisdom and only Piper needs intelligence. But everybody needs dexterity and everybody except Piper can do with some strength. The twist is... Our party can only carry 999,000 gold before it rolls over to zero, which means that each trip to Ambrosia will only let us bump up around 90 stat points. We're going to have to make a lot of trips, and finding the whirlpool every time is pretty time consuming. It's also a little callous when you think about it. Every time we go to Ambrosia, our entire crew dies. We sacrifice them to the sea again and again. 
even though they're pirates, it's still pretty cold-hearted. Maybe not as bad as killing innocent jesters was in Ultima 1, but there is no way around it. There is, however, a way to round grinding the overworld for gold. Southeast of Britain is an island containing a nameless dungeon, commonly referred to in the fan community as the Dungeon of the Snake, as it's, only the, as it's the only dungeon containing the snake mark. This makes it mandatory in any playthrough, but that's not why we're visiting at this point. For our purposes, the dungeon also contains 12 treasure chests on its very first level. They're behind secret doors, but once you've mapped the place out, you can find them easily. The treasures are in three of the first floor's corners. They hold gear you can sell too, and between them and the few random encounters you'll have on each dive, you can easily clear a thousand gold per trip. Leave, jump back down, and they all reset. This is faster than seeking combat in the overworld would be, and as soon as you have 9,000 gold, make another Ambrosia trip. Is it still a grind? Yes, it is tedious. But it's miles better than our Ultima 1 and 2 grinding, and we can shorten trips with your Clerics or Wizards Teleport Up a Floor spell. Anyway, as soon as we have 9,000 gold, we want to start hitting the Dexterity Shrine. We've got to jump on our ship and set sail, hunting that whirlpool again. When we find it, we're going to want to head due east. This time, something starts shooting at us. We find another pirate ship and take it easily. We're just going to use it to puddle jump here. The Shrine of Dexterity is just through this door. This time, we're going to focus on the sneaks first. More dexterity means he's able to disable traps more easily and makes them harder to hit. Sneaks is an elf, which means his dexterity cap is 99, so it costs 7,400 to bring him up from 25. We're going to want to boost everyone's dexterity, however. Everyone benefits from avoiding hits, so let's move down the list and spend the rest of our gold on bumping up Healy from 15 to 34. We'll have to come back and repeat this twice to get everybody where they need to be after a few dozen more dungeon delves. Getting out is simple, we just jump back in our ship, sail around to this gate, use a key, then pop into the whirlpool. The process is the same for the most part for strength. Grind up coins in the dungeon, find the whirlpool, head northwest. There are a few more foes on this route. We run into mains and two sets of wild horses before finding the shrine. We want to boast our physical attackers, which is everybody but Piper, so that'll take a few more trips. Our final run will be to the intelligence shrine, and Piper is the only one who needs it. Her max intelligence is 99, so we need 7500 gold, and this gives her 99 MP and access to the nameless spells that kills everyone on the screen. Piper also has a spell that costs 45 and lets her use whatever's left to cast a clerical spell, but I don't think I've ever used it. Whatever, we've got all the cards, we've boosted everyone's stats, it's time to hit the dungeons. No more quick dips for cash or a first floor mark. We're going to need to dive deep to the bottom of a few very dank pits. Okay, we return to the snake dungeon one last time. This seems like a good time to show off our cleric spell, Vieda. it gives us a look at the map of the local area. We're the blinking asterisk in the upper right corner, the perforated looking walls are secret doors, the squares are regular doors, and the question marks might be traps, signs, chests, marks, or fountains, basically anything else. This is a huge help when mapping the places out, and you can cast this in towns or the overworld as well, once you have the 55 magic points that it costs, so after visiting Ambrosia and raising your wisdom. The down arrow is our target. We need to get to the bottom of the dungeon. The second level is a big empty room with another ladder, which we can take to the third. Mm -hmm. 
dungeon encounters aren't too tough for us until the very bottom, but it can be easy to forget where you were heading if you were navigating with a map. Down on the fifth floor, we get an admonishment. Don't drink. Here it's good advice. Any fountains on this floor are poison. The sixth floor writings are the same. Don't drink. But we can ignore it because of the four fountains in this starting area. Two cure you of poison and two heal you to max hit points. Don't always believe what you read, kids. The seventh floor is full of gremlins that will steal your food. These were the toughest foe in Ultima 1, stealing half your food per hit. But in Ultima 3, they're more like traps. You can map them and avoid them. Level 8 is our target here, and it's a disconnected level. The two areas you reach via the different level 7 ladders aren't connected. But down here are two marks, Kings, or Fire in the Nest Port, and Snake. Since we already have the Mark of Kings, we can just grab the Snake Mark. We don't absolutely need each mark on every character. I think the snake mark is only needed by whoever uses the yell command, but I'm going to give it to everybody just for symmetry's sake and in case I forget who I gave it to. It's only 50 hit points, it barely hurts. We'll use our cleric spell to teleport to the surface, and now it's off to the next dungeon. We now need the mark of fire, which allows us to cross flaming floors without pain. The mark of fire is actually hidden in a few dungeons, but it's easiest to reach in the mines of Morinia for reasons that will become quickly apparent. The mines are on the western side of the continent, just north of Grey. As you can see here, the ladder reaches from ceiling to floor, meaning you can go up or down. So we go down, and down, and down all the way to the 8th floor. And honestly, we don't really have much of a choice. The only way to access the rest of any given floor is with the Cleric's Lib Rex spell, which teleports you randomly around a level. However, while each level has a bunch of treasure hidden away amidst the traps and monsters, we are pretty much past the point of needing gold, so we're just going to head straight to the bottom. After a quick trip into a hidden treasure room, I, I know I said we don't need it, but why not? It's not far out of the way and we can buy more torches or something. We find the Mark of Fire on the opposite side of the floor. Now that we have the Mark of Fire, we're going to learn to Lord British's castle to talk to that jester he has roasting in a pit of fire for some reason. West 8, South 35, and await Dawn. This is a clue as to the location of our last town, Dawn which is 8 tiles west and 35 south from the castle. It also only appears when both moons are new, so we're actually going to go 7 west so we end up next to it and not on top when it appears. I'm trying really hard to remember how many steps south we were when the battle started. And there it is! Dawn lasts but a brief moment. True, it disappears as soon as the moon changes, so only a few turns on the world map. It won't vanish while we're here or anything. 
We could buy horses here, but there's no need to at this point of the game. We're not trying to avoid encounters. Ambrosia awaits. Well, been there, done that. Okay, here we go. Dig up exotics. That's a new command, dig, and we'll need it to find the exotics. Dig carefully. Nothing new there. Now, to talk to this third guy, we would need to murder one of his friends here. Only way to reach him. And again, the game is asking you to kill innocents. If you do, he tells you to dig on islands. But you know what? You're not going to make a murderer out of me, Richard Garriott. This time he gets to live. In the Nintendo port, you don't get the dig command. Instead, there's two picks you need to dig up the exotic arms and exotic armors called Mystics in that version. We can find the gold pick here in the guild shop, you'd have to steal it from a chest, and the silver pick is in a dungeon that we're not going to visit this playthrough. We now have all the info we need to find the exotic weapons and armor, which are located on small two-tile islands near Fawn and Grey. We can just keep digging to get as many as we want, but we only need four of each and we can't sell them. These armors are decent, while the weapons aren't ranged, they're the only ones that can hurt the creatures in Exodus's castle. For now, everyone is going to want to equip the armor, and Healy, who has no ranged weapon anyway, will equip the exotic weapon. This is a good time to buy the best ranged weapons we can for our fighter. In the computer port, it's the bow plus four, called the silver bow in the Nintendo version. Only two dungeons left, which is great because my voice is dying on me. First, the Dungeon of Time, which we can reach through the same methods we used to find the hidden town of Devilguard. Just take the moon gate to the landlocked valley and the moon gate to the smaller space with just just take the moon gate to the landlocked valley and then this moon gate to a smaller space with just one dungeon. We're headed here for some information. It's another place you can skip visiting if you know everything or just want to look it up light uh, or just want to look it up online and want to speed run things. The layout of the first few floors is highly symmetrical, but when we hit floor 4, we can skip over to another one of those ladders that head straight to the bottom, skipping a lot of treasures we don't need. We could have tried doing this before Ambrosia, when the treasure would have helped, but it's still slower than just running the first level of the snake mark dungeon over and over. Thank you. 
The bottom floor holds a mark of kings and a mark of fire, but we already have those, so we just go to the opposite corner where we meet the Time Lord. I guess Richard was a Doctor Who fan, too. You see a vision of the Time Lord. He tells you the one way is love, soul, moons, and death. All else fails. Whatever that means. Uh, it can't be a coincidence that our shrine gave us cards of love, soul, moons, and death. We could not beat the game without this information, and this is the only place to get it. But the game does not check to see if you visited the Time Lord to figure it out. One more dungeon to go. The Dungeon of Doom, hidden in the deep forest west of where Dawn is. We need the Mark of Force, which lets us pass through force fields protecting Exodus. There's also the Mark of Force in the Dungeon of Fire, but the Dungeon of Doom is easier and has fewer traps. We don't get a single long ladder leading to the bottom here, but the levels aren't too tricky to navigate. The bottom floor gives us our mark behind a secret door, which we burn into our flesh. And there's a lot of treasure down here in the corners. I'll grab some, but we absolutely don't need it for anything. All that's left is the end game. After visiting Lord British to update our max HP and heal up, we set sail to the Silver Serpent we saw earlier, avoiding the Whirlpool because we do not want to be distracted by Ambrosia right now, and yell. Yell is an actual command with the Y key. Evocare and Boom were on the other side of the serpent. Again, with the Nintendo port, you'd use the horn that they gave you. Time to enter Exodus's castle. The Nintendo port has a completely different layout that I'm not going to cover, so you're on your own there. We get into a fight and realize that even with the exotic armor, we do not have the hits to survive the gauntlets ahead of us that would it take to reach Exodus itself. And there are some tough, unfair fights ahead. So instead, we're going to retreat and level up for a while. How much? Well, for this playthrough, I'm going to grind fights until everyone is at least level 25, giving them the maximum of 2,550 hit points. You probably don't need that many, but I would recommend hitting at least level 20 to be safe. And then it's just a grueling gauntlet through fights against the toughest monsters in the game. Balwands, Wyverns, and worst of all, the floor. Floors are... I don't know, they don't show up on the screen. They only take one hit to kill, but they do a ton of damage per hit. And letting them hit you is the only real way to find out where they are. As far as tactics that work go, well, first your cleric and wizard have spells that hit everything, but you only have so many MP and you're hit with multiple fights against them without rest. Two, you can line up and march around using who gets hit as a clue at, to where the enemies are. Maybe the best way, though, is to just stand there and swing your weapons in front of you. If they get hit, it's their own fault. Poisoned, battered, exhausted, low on food, we're finally face to face with Exodus itself. 
a mainframe computer. How did Minax and Mondane have a computer child? It doesn't matter, we just need to defeat it. This is, amusingly enough, the only science fiction element in Ultima 3. No blasters, no spaceships, just a computer. And in grand science fiction tradition, we defeat it with our cards. Our punch cards, inserting them into each server in the order the Time Lord told us to. And so it came to pass that on this day, Exodus, Hellborn Incarnate of Evil, was vanquished from Caesarea. What now lies ahead in the Ultima Saga can only be pure speculation. Onward to Ultima 4. And that's it. That is Ultima 3 Exodus. My final evaluation is that Ultima 3 was leaps and bounds ahead of Ultimas 1 and 2, but it is still very much a game of its era. It might be the first full application of the early CRPG format, and makes a good enough capstone of the first three games in the series, being very much the story of how Richard Garriott learned game design. I have a certain fondness for it. The Nintendo version was the first Ultima game that I was able to beat, but I would rate it as simply competent. Ultima 4, the one that comes next, is the first game in the series that I would call truly great. I'm going to take a break from the series before covering Ultima 4 to cover some other RPG and adventure games that more properly belong to the early 80s. Maybe some Infocom text adventures, maybe the Bard's Tale series, maybe Wizardry or Megami Tensai. But I will be back for Ultima 4 in a few months, so make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it when I do. Feel free to mention in the comments if there are any early 80s games you think need to be covered.